Hello and welcome to Original Sound Chat, where video game music is a work of art. On each episode, it's our goal to help you learn about two soundtracks from the world of games, as well as the people, stories, and critical tracks behind them. My name is Peter Spasia, and we're brought to you by Anonymous Dinosaur and Rhymes with Asia. It's time to appreciate great OSTs and the games that they come from without getting too bogged down in music theory. Our game this week on this solo episode is the Dreamcast showpiece that highlighted an unprecedented amount of detail in its open world, while also naming and popularizing the gameplay concept of QuickTime Events, 1999's Shenmue. It's been a crazy week, and as we come to the end of our time for production on this week's episode, things just fell that it, it falls to me to do a solo episode for you this week, and what a soundtrack to highlight on this solo episode with Shenmue, a game that is uh, fondly remembered, I think, for its cult classic status of what it tried to accomplish in certain gameplay terms with its open world and the attention to detail in its open world, especially at the turn of the century. It may not be the best game and have aged uh, pretty poorly, but you know what? The soundtrack is still phenomenal, so I'll talk about that today. It's too bad Joe's not here. I've been meaning to ask him what he's been playing, how he's been doing with that. I finally found a game that I wanted to uh, start and continue, and that would be Horizon Forbidden West. I don't know if I got to talking about it on the show. I tried Elden Ring. It did not click with me. Granted, I've had struggles, as I've documented on the show before, with Soulsborne games, uh, but that kind of surprised me. I was kind of taken for a loop on that. Maybe I was just in a bad rut with games, but... Oh man, Horizon Forbidden West, like I knew I would love the sequel considering I loved the original game and it does so many good things. I am 10 hours in and I just hit the point in the story I cleared the Death's Door level. And that's a, a pretty critical mission in the game, a very, very long mission. Uh, we were kind of going through an ancient vault, so to speak, uh, but it recontextualizes some things in the mythos of that world. And that is that is really interesting. Looking forward to playing more. Also enjoying playing on story difficulty, where, you know, at level 15 or so, I encountered a Thunderjaw, which is the T-Rex version of that kind of machine animal in that world. And it was at level 30, just ran into it in the open world, kind of like the, Haha, this is way too powerful, come back to it later. I mean, I'm on story difficulty. I can try to grind it out. And sure enough, with enough patience, took down that thunder jaw and like gained a whole level from just doing that level 16. Okay. So it's some good time so far with horizon forbidden West, definitely enjoying the soundtrack, but it's not one that's like standing out as like, Oh, these are great classic songs. Oh my gosh. Uh, just an incredible accomplishment though, from the team over at gorilla there for just uh, creating music that just really complements the open world environment to the point where like I had a, a glitch where like the music caught out and it's just like, Oh, you feel how much you miss the soundtrack in that game. That may be one to look on uh, by year's end, but also some great soundtracks so far this year. Let's talk about some composer follow-up news. A lot of things happening in the game industry with some headlines where we follow up on some games that we've talked about, composers that we've talked about, and see how their work is being used. So let's talk about Splatoon 3 and how it finally got a release date. Splatoon 3 is dropping on uh, 3 squared, September 9th, 9-9 on Nintendo Switch. Of course, we've talked about the original Splatoon on episode 136 of the show. Wouldn't be surprised if we saw some more music from Toru Minigishi there. Also, BBC Proms is a thing that over here in the United States, we're not really aware of, but it is an annual music festival that's held in England. And this year, they are hosting Gaming Prom from 8-Bit to Infinity, which is the first video game music concert in this Proms series. And that will be held on Monday, August 1st at the Royal Albert Hall and it'll feature a new arrangement of music from Battlefield 2042, as originally composed by Hilder Guonadotur and Sam Slater. Uh, it'll be performed by the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, as you might expect over there in England, 
Also, music from Dear Esther, composed by Jessica Curry, will also feature, as well as themes from Kingdom Hearts and Shadow of the Colossus. I feel like once you start having all these video game music concerts that pull different game music altogether, we've highlighted a few of those on the show before, and it's great to see video game music being recognized in a series such as Proms. Persona Super Live P-Sound Wish 2022 takes place on October 8th and 9th. This is the Persona music concert that takes place in Japan, and Persona, even a bigger thing in Japan than it is in the rest of the world, and Persona music especially. In fact, it's usually Persona music concerts where the next Persona games get announced. I mean, you can even go back in years past, like it's usually at the end of the shows where like they'll show trailers for the big games coming up, whether it's the dancing spinoffs or even Persona 5 itself. So that could be something exciting to uh, look forward to, especially when it's, I think it's the 25th anniversary of Persona. So yeah, pretty big deal there. Or at least it was. Yeah, no, 1996 was that. So we just passed the 25th anniversary, but they're still rolling on and celebrating with COVID. It's, it's going to be a big deal. Keep an eye on early October. Hopefully some more Persona news coming out there. Monster Prom 3 Monster Road Trip has a free demo out now. We talked about Monster Prom in episode 69. So, hey, that's a nice little surprise. I guess the game's coming out soon, but hey, free demo out now on Steam. And to wrap things up, Ace Attorney is having a 20th anniversary concert this week on May 7th. And we've talked about games from the Gyakuten Saiban mainline series, uh, episode 11, 35, and 168 most recently with talking about games 1, 6, and 3 in the original Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney main sort of sextet of games there. So let's talk about the game that I am covering this week, and that would be Shenmu. Shenmu Isho Yokosuka released on December 29th, 1999 in Japan on Sega Dreamcast. We have not covered too many Sega Dreamcast games. I think the only one we've really covered, well, there was Sonic Adventure 2, there was Marvel vs. Capcom 2, but there have not been too many others. But yes, Shenmu launched in North America on November 8th, 2000, and then Europe on December 1st, 2000. It was developed by Sega AM2 and published by Sega. Shenmue is a third-person, open-world action-adventure game. The environmental detail in the open world was considered unprecedented at the time, with numerous interactive objects a day and night system, variable weather effects, non-player characters with daily schedules, and various mini-games. A lot of those may seem commonplace now in open world games, but uh, you honestly compare it back to when we were talking about The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time that kind of broached the idea of the open world onto the gaming space. And wow, even then, like you see how far open worlds kind of went from that game to Shenmue and Shenmue kind of really laid the foundation for how we know as open worlds today. I mean, even a year later, Grand Theft Auto 3, I mean, that would kind of really blow things up as, you know, the sandbox that you can fully interact with. But Shenmue was a pretty big deal at the time for having all this attention to detail in their environments. You could encounter enemies in the open world and this would involve brawler battles, which are similar to a 3D fighting game like Virtua Fighter. And that makes sense because Sega AM2 is the team that was known for developing Virtua Fighter. So kind of bringing that fighting engine over. But Shenmue is famous for naming and popularizing the quick time event, which if you do not know the term, it's a button press that is generally prompted during a cinematic cutscene that needs to be acted upon quickly and correctly as a way to inject the player into the game's movie. So the plot of Shenmue and that movie, so to speak, in Yokosuka, Japan, 1986, teenage martial artist Ryo Hazuki returns to his family dojo to witness a confrontation between his father, Iwao, and a Chinese man named Lan Di. Lan Di easily incapacitates Ryo, 
and threatens to kill him unless Iwao gives him a mysterious stone artifact known as the Dragon Mirror. Iwao tells him the mirror is buried under the cherry blossom tree outside. As his men recover the mirror, Lan Di mentions a man he claims Iwao killed in China. He delivers a finishing blow, and Iwao dies in Ryo's arms. Swearing revenge on Lan Di, but not knowing what his name is, Ryo begins his investigation by asking locals about what they witnessed and taking a job as a forklift driver down by the local harbor. So what is the secret of the Dragon Mirror? What happens when a local gang kidnaps Ryo's school friend, Nozomi? And can Ryo get his revenge on Lan Di? This is where I would ask Joe, Hey Joe, what are our experiences with Shenmue? But he's not here, so what are my experiences with Shenmue? Obviously you heard of the name, heard different things about it, seen different things about it, famous for the quick time events, of course. Uh, things like forklift driving, you know, meme status there, right? Uh, familiar with Ryo as a character, how he kind of pops up in different things. Like, I think he's in one of the Sonic and Sega All-Star Racing games, if I'm not mistaken. It was like a kind of later edition. Maybe it was in the All-Star Racing Transforms. Don't quote me on that. I'm just kind of pulling from the recesses of my memory there. But I've never played Shenmue. And it's one of those things, like, I've always heard that, like, ah, the game hasn't aged too well. And from what Joe's kind of told me about his experience with Shenmue, it's like, yeah, it's it's not great, at least by today's standards. As if you look back at the time, it's like, whoa, that's that's impressive what they're trying to do. But again, yeah, the gameplay does not hold up. But it held up enough to, you know, have a sequel and then people wanting a third game to kind of round out the trilogy for years and years. And then there's a whole story with that that we'll get to. But yeah, Shenmue, a notable game franchise, but definitely one that was kind of stuck in the Dreamcast era and never moved forward until late in the 2010s. So developing Shenmue it brings its own interesting stories about uh, because after developing several successful Sega arcade games, including 1985's Hang On, 1986's Outrun, and 1993's Virtua Fighter, director Yu Suzuki wanted to create a longer experience and conceived Shenmue as a multi-part epic. It would be starting in 1996 that Sega AM2 began work on a role-playing game for the Sega Saturn set in the Virtua Fighter world, titled Virtua Fighter RPG, Akira's Story. Well, development on this moved to the Dreamcast in 1997, and then to better market this game as a Dreamcast killer app, the Virtua Fighter connection was dropped entirely, and Suzuki announced that this would be under a working title, Project Berkeley. Sega even announced that this game was so unique that it belonged to a new genre that it termed Full Reactive Eyes Entertainment, or FREE. That's some stretching of an acronym if I've ever heard one. By the time of the Dreamcast's release in Japan in November 1998, the game had been titled Shenmue. The setting in Shenmue is modeled on Dobuita in Yokosuka, Japan, and the team worked with interior decorators to design more than 1,200 rooms and locations. They also created over 300 characters with their own names, personalities, relationships, and some of these characters were even modeled on Sega employees, and they used detailed clay models as animation references. To go even further of the amount of detail they were putting in this open world, they took meteorological records from 1986 Yokosuka, and they used them to create algorithmically generated weather day and night cycles. Like we mentioned in Ocarina of Time, the cutscenes ran in real time in the game's engine, and that helped save space on the CD-ROM. But since this was at a time when open worlds were a new concept, and you're trying all these different things and kind of putting it in a video game blender, so to speak, a lot of bugs are sure to happen in the game's programming and its appearance and all of this. And apparently there were no bug tracking systems. 
at the time. So the development team used an Excel spreadsheet to fix bugs in the game. And the team tracked over 10,000 bugs at one point that were in need of fixing. The localization of Shenmue is also fraught with uh, decisions and stories. So a lot of problems were exacerbated, of course, by the project scale. You have a lot going on in an open world. Also though, at Suzuki's insistence, the English voices were recorded in Japan. And of course, this would greatly restrict the casting. Localizer Jeremy Blaustein said, quote, We hired basically every single English-speaking person that exists in Japan and calls themselves a voice actor. So you're getting a big range of talent, but not a big pool to choose from. So the scripts were also translated by several people, creating consistency problems, and it also arrived late. That left no time for rewrites or proper direction. It just seemed like a mess. The Japanese version of the game also had heavy product placement with brands like Coca-Cola and Timex. Like, Rio, where's a Timex watch? Oh, he gets Coca-Cola from the vending machines. Uh, but these were replaced with fictional brands for the versions of the game outside of Japan due to strict specifications for brand implementation. So when you have Jet Cola, yeah, that would, that would actually be Coca-Cola in the original Japanese version. Oops. You can't just have product placement. This almost reminds me of the the, uh, the Dole Banana situation in the original Super Monkey Ball. They had a big Dole Banana partnership. Dole Bananas, bananas and bananas everywhere. Uh, but you can't have that going forward in more than one version of the game. The, the brands have their contracts, right? So reminds me of that. As a result of all this and its big grand scope, Shenmue became the most expensive video game ever developed at the time with an estimated production and marketing cost between 47 and $70 million. Though some of this also helped cover the sequel and helped make it easier to develop. But wow, for the time, that is uh, steep. Of course, game costs have only increased many times over, but uh, for the time, uh, that's a lot for a video game in the late 90s. But the game reviewed well with a game rankings average of 89%. It received positive reviews for its graphics, soundtrack, and ambition, though there were plenty of criticisms for its invisible walls, abundance of cutscenes, English voice acting, and the slow pace and mundane detail of the open world design, with the inability to progress without waiting for scheduled events. People weren't really used to this kind of game design, and it showed at the time. A lot of people reflect on it and kind of say like it was a game with great ideas and it expands what video games can be to tell human stories, but people found it to be ultimately uninteresting. And despite sales of 1.2 million copies, Shenmue did not recoup its development cost, its high development cost, and it was considered a commercial failure. It would have been a success for most games, especially at the time, but instead, the fourth best-selling game for Dreamcast was another nail in the coffin for Sega getting out of the console manufacturer business. Brendan Main over at The Escapist looked back on the game in 2010, saying, quote, If the Grand Theft Auto games have been vilified as crime simulators in which you can press a button to buy a hooker and then run a hooker over with a car, Shenmue is a game where you can press a button to politely ask directions, then combo into cherishing your elders and always remembering to recycle. Instead of giving us a city to be tested and battered against in all directions, Shenmue builds you a world and asks you to follow the rules rather than break them. Shenmue was nominated for four awards at the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Awards. We now know those as the Dice Awards including Console Game of the Year, and it won for Console Innovation. It received the Excellence Prize for Interactive Art at the 2000 Japan Media Arts Festival, and it was also honored for graphical achievement by Edge Magazine. Shenmue still attracted a cult following. Despite all of this, it has appeared in several lists of the greatest video games of all time, 
and it's credited for pioneering game mechanics such as quick time events and open worlds. And obviously it wasn't enough of a failure to still commit to making a sequel in the planned vision of Yu Suzuki. But after the release of 2001's Shenmue 2, which was yet another commercial failure, further Shenmue games entered development hell, and Yu Suzuki left Sega AM2 in 2003. In 2004, Sega announced a massively multiplayer online role-playing game for PC set in the Shenmue world, Shenmue Online, but it was never released. I had never heard of that. Same thing with, in 2010, Sega announced another spinoff, Shenmue City, a social game for the Yahoo Mobage mobile service. How have I never heard of these things? It was apparently shut down in late 2011, so it didn't last all that long. And so for years, we thought we would never learn the ending of this Shenmue trilogy. And this is especially noted when Yu Suzuki appeared in a Mega 64 video to discuss how Shenmue would end because Suzuki left Sega altogether in 2011. But seemingly out of nowhere, in 2015, there were pictures of forklifts on the E3 show floor. And at Sony's press conference, there was an announcement for a Kickstarter to bring about the development of Shenmue 3. This Kickstarter campaign for Shenmue 3 ended up funding fully in nine hours after it went live, and it ended up being the most funded video game in Kickstarter's history. As far as campaigns only on Kickstarter, it succeeded Bloodstained Ritual of the Night with $6.3 million raised on the platform. Apparently, Sega tried to remake the first two Shenmue games, and this was canceled in 2017, but in 2018, Sega released high-definition remastered ports of Shenmue and Shenmue 2 for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Yu Suzuki would then develop Shenmue 3 independently, and it would be released for PlayStation 4 and PC in 2019. Two admittedly mixed results, but you know what? At least we got the game. And then this year, there's an anime adaptation of Shenmue. That's out of nowhere. I was watching Adult Swim the other day. and like, oh, Shenmue, the animation. Like, that. that's a thing? That's a thing. So, very strange there. When we talk about the soundtrack for Shenmue, I feel like we have to talk about one, Takenobu Mitsuyoshi. Takenobu Mitsuyoshi was born on Christmas, December 25th, 1967, in Fukuoka, Fukuoka Prefecture in Japan. He is blood type O. Don't come across many blood type O's when Japanese musicians are giving their blood type away just so readily. But he graduated in 1990 with a degree in economics from Tohoku Gakuen University, but then started working on music at Sega. Early on in his career, he went by the aliases R. Saburomaru and R3. His favorite music genres are Motown, techno pop, 80s western music, jazz, and fusion. Like many people I feel in Japan, uh, he was influenced to start music because of Yellow Magic Orchestra, or YMO, but he also enjoyed listening to Kraftwerk, Sheik Korea, Cassiopeia, and T-Square in his youth. He also said the first record that he bought was the soundtrack to Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. When he comes up with his melodies, he says, quote, I feel that a melody must be something that you can sing. Idealistically, a melody should be something people can hum after listening to it once. So basically, when I make my melodies, I sing. Since I cannot sing at my office, I hum in a little voice. I think that's adorable. He's been trying to produce dinner shows with music lately, as far as what he's doing these days. Uh, but he's had the need to postpone them because of, you know, COVID and how it's still going on everywhere, but especially in Japan. He loves tonkatsu ramen, beer, and watching professional baseball. And his favorite video game series, at least in an early 2000s interview, 
was the Resident Evil series. Takenobu Mitsuyoshi is most well known, and as far as if you know video game music, he composed and sang the music to Daytona USA. An arcade classic, at least from my youth in American arcades. And so he does consider Let's Go Away from Daytona USA to be his theme song. You can follow Takenobu Mitsuyoshi on Twitter at Take underscore Mitsuyoshi. His discography as a composer includes Outrunners, Daytona USA, Virtua Fighter 2 and 3, Virtua Striker and Virtua Striker 2, Sega Rally Championship, Sonic the Fighters, Shenmue, Shenmue 2, Sega Rally 2006, and Daytona 2011. He is also a voice actor. Takenobu Mitsuyoshi is the voice of Akira Yuki in the original Virtua Fighter only, just only for that game. But then he's Kagemaru for the entire series except for Virtua Fighter 2 for some reason. He also plays himself in Fantasy Star 2 Online. He's the Japanese announcer in Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed, and he is the competition announcer in Sonic Mania. Super Smash Bros. fans may recognize Takenobu Mitsuyoshi as he was the arranger and vocalist in F-Zero medley in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. On the Shenmue soundtrack, composers include Takenobu Mitsuyoshi, Yuzo Koshiro, Takeshi Yanagawa, Osamu Murata, and Ryuji Iyuchi. Shenmue was the first time that Mitsuyoshi worked with several other composers, but Mitsuyoshi was also the only one of those who had visited China, which would be important for the game's plot and also would inspire the game's musical influences, as the first game was set in Japan, but we would go to Hong Kong for its sequel, and then ideally, at the time it was planned, that you know, would go to mainland China for the finale to take down Lan Di. It was interesting to find an interview where Mitsuyoshi was reflecting on his work on Shenmue, which is the interview was done in the early 2000s, so it really hit. And so he's had this quote, which I just found really interesting. It's a long one, but bear with me. Quote, with music for arcade games, the objective was to have people in arcades notice the game. And the music was made with that in mind, focusing on impact and how catchy you can make it and to bring the player who threw in the coin into the game as soon as possible. But with Shenmue, it was quite the opposite. I had to focus on music, which the players would hardly notice, but would have some emotional effect. Concerning the tone and pitch of the music, the setting being in Yokosuka, I had to minimize the Chinese taste and have the players feel Yokosuka, or the present day of Japan, as much as possible. On top of that, it was Yu Suzuki who made the final judgments on the music, and the ones that I made with freedom weeded out. Only the music which matched with Yu Suzuki's image of Shenmue were kept. Also, there were restrictions on the hardware. There are many songs which I wanted to make with better quality, but had to give up due to the hardware spec. And so this is ultimately a question of him being asked, like, how much freedom did you feel like you had with the music? And so he's like, well, you know, I feel like I had some, but ultimately because of Suzuki's final word, probably I didn't really have as much as I thought. And the team ended up making like around 300 pieces of music for Shenmue, with about 200 making the final cut, Mitsuyoshi made about 20 of these. So you can just tell like the volume of like incidental music tracks made by this large team. Though Mitsuyoshi's music from Shenmue was performed live at the first symphonic game music concert in Leipzig, Germany in 2003. According to his Wikipedia article, it was the first time that a concert featuring video game music was held outside Japan. So I think that's interesting to tie in with the BBC Prom story. Like we're seeing more of these and, you know, higher profile concerts, but 
2003 symphonic game music concert in Leipzig and it had Shenmue music at it. So uh, that's, I just thought it was very interesting, but this is a classic soundtrack. It's one that I've, when I've heard like a Pandora station of video game music, different tracks from Shenmue have popped up on it. And so I have associations there with some of these tracks, but not really anything with where it takes place in the game. In fact, I couldn't find much information there. So bear with me as let's talk about the five critical tracks for Shenmue. And we'll start with that first critical track, Shenmue, Sedge Tree. I feel like if there is a track from Shenmue, it has to be this one. It's obviously it's titled Shenmue, but this is the main theme of the game as far as I could tell. And it's the melody I certainly recognize as being immediately Shenmue. I mean, for the piece to open up and it's this, you know, kind of dark brooding piano, but it's really when the clip comes in here and it's this Japanese stringed instrument that is just gorgeous. I'm amazed by the music quality here for you know late 90s, early 2000s, and it just sounds so remarkable with the piano coming in and then the strings. I mean, just a gorgeous, beautiful piece for Shenmue. And again, I, I wish I could find more information about where these tracks play. Like, is this the opening movie? Is this like the title screen? From what I could tell, it doesn't seem to be the beginning of the game, but as far as I could tell, a very important piece and one that just as far as my cursory video game music knowledge goes, this is like, yep, this is the one for Shenmue. And what do you know? It's titled Shenmue. So there you go. And it's composed by Takenobu Mitsuyoshi. So unfortunately, the only track here on the Critical 5 and Cutting Room Floor done by him you know, kind of picked the tracks first and then kind of went back and see who did what. But you know what? For a piece that Mitsuyoshi did, this sure is an amazing one. And I would imagine one that definitely gets included in Shenmue music compilations in video game music concerts. But if it's not that track, this track has to be considered in a Shenmue music medley of sorts. And this is another famous one from this game. Number two on the Critical Five. This is Shenhua. Sedge Flower. According to the Shenmue fandom page, Shenhua is a mysterious teenaged girl. She is named after the flower of the Shenmue tree located outside of her house. She's the girl with the pigtails and the yellow hat that you see on the box art. And yeah, looking at this picture of her from her interpretation in Shenmue 3, I'm like, oh, this character. I know this character. Okay, this is Shenhua. Okay. All right, so a theme to represent her. Did not know going into this that the Shenmue tree is what gave the game its name with cherry blossoms and all. Okay, that makes sense. This is another track where, yeah, this is unabashedly Shenmue. And it's this da 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 da. Like, oh, just a gorgeous, full sound of these instruments playing and just fantastic and beautiful and um wow I, I feel like between these two themes like you could just say yep pack it in this is all you need to know about Shenmue's soundtrack of course there's more to that uh, but we'll get to that shortly but yeah just wow uh, Shenmue and Shenhua 
you know, that's, that's it. Uh, those are the main ones. Thank you. Pack it up. But let's also then move on to number three and continue our musical exploration of the Critical Five tracks for Shenmue. And this one's a pretty emotionally heavy one, I would say. This one here is Nozomi's Confession. If you would have guessed that I picked this song because of Joe and his love for piano music, you'd be right. But also, I mean, my God, who doesn't love piano music? And this is just gorgeous and a little wistful at the same time. So Nozomi is Ryo's friend from school. And from what I could gather in the comments on YouTube, uh, there is an unrequited love between Nozomi and Ryo where, oh, she sure has feelings for him and Ryo just, yeah, she's a friend. And so people in the comments noted that this is the quote, friend zone national anthem. Poor, poor Nozomi. Whereas Shenhua is composed by Ryuji Iuchi, this track is composed by Osamu Murata, and it's also noted as like an OST version in certain titlings of this because there's like a Nozomi and Rio song that has different instrumentation. But this one seems to be the one that fans know and appreciate more. And it's, again, the piano recording is just really nice and just gorgeous. And wow, it stuck out. And I feel like when it, you're talking about uh, the relationship between two pretty major characters, especially when Nozomi gets kidnapped by this gang and... Rio's got to save her. Uh, it's an important theme, I feel like, in this game, and one that stood out. I, again, there were many tracks where it's like, oh, I've heard this before, probably from that Pandora video game music station, but, uh, you know, this one, this is a nice one. The next track on the Critical Five for Shenmue, let's take things up a notch. This is Earth and Sea. I love how this track leans into like the epic stakes. Like this, this feels like a big confrontation piece. And granted, I feel like also you get a little bit more of like the sense of midis at play here. And maybe this is some of the limitations of the hardware that Mitsuyoshi was talking about. Even though this piece was composed by Ryuji Iuchi, this feels like an end game fight. And people in the comments were talking about a 70 man fight. That seems excessive but also just the feeling of stakes here and the epic nature of it. I love a lot of the Japanese instruments are just at least well represented here. It really gives you a good sense of the environment that Shenmue takes place in. And it's different than a lot of the tracks that you'll hear on this soundtrack at least. And that's something I think also to note when I'm reading in this research about like, we ended up with like 200 tracks in Shenmue and I'm like, where is this on the original soundtrack? Uh, Cause you only have so many there. And it makes me wonder like maybe the selection for tracks for the OST was limited here. And that's kind of what I, I went based off of. You'd think that it's like, it's an important representation of the game's music, but it sure sounds like when you're talking about a big open world, there are a lot of places for other music tracks to come in. And maybe it's like, uh, where's the regular battle theme when you know, Rio's encountering uh, someone on the streets of Yokosuka, uh, you know, not too sure. It didn't seem to come across. So maybe that's my lack of experience with the game coming in, but I feel like these were at least good selections for what was on the OST. And we'll wrap things up with a nice vocal piece. Number five on the Critical Five for Shenmue. This is Wish. i mm-hmm. 
All right, so the best I could find about this piece was that it plays in the scene where Ryo takes Nozomi home on a motorcycle. If this isn't an end credits theme, I'll be mad. Not, okay, not really mad, but like this has end credits theme written all over it and maybe it's not uh, and that that's okay. But you know, for a lot of tracks that we cover on this show, it feels like the vocal theme is what represents the end credits in a game. A uh, wish composed by Ryuji Iuchi. And apparently, according to Takenobu Mitsuyoshi, he says, quote, By the way, there is a version of the same song where I perform the vocal. Of course, it was a tentative version. My voice was used until we recorded the real female artist's song. And that would be Yumiko Yamamoto with the vocals. But wow, what I would give to hear... Mitsuyoshi singing this song. Again, it's probably in the Sega Vault, nowhere to be heard, but you know what? It's just a really nice song, and I feel like it rounded out their Critical 5 nicely. For my cutting room floor for Shenmue, I really went with a couple songs that, yep, really stuck out to me as I have heard this before because of video game music on Pandora. So let's get to a couple of those with not much knowledge of where they take place in the game, but this first one here on the cutting room floor is Cherry Blossom Wind Dance. gorgeous environmental piece with this one. And, and when the Shenmue tree is a cherry blossom tree, I, I feel like that's a big importance there. Again, could not tell you where it takes place in the game, but that feels pretty important. But just yeah, gorgeous atmosphere, the piano going in, these, these plucked strings. Just love the surrounding environment here that this music creates. And you just imagine cherry blossom petals falling. Love it, love it, love it. This one is composed by Osamu Murata. And people in the YouTube comments says it plays in the Passport disc. I don't know what that is, but it seemed like it's pretty far out of the way because some people were saying, like, I played the whole game and I don't know where this takes place. But, wow, this is one where, like, oh, I've absolutely heard this one before. A little surprising, then, that it's not a prominent piece, even though it's on the OST. Eh, it's, it's confusing. People were also saying that, quote, Breezewax sampled this song on Winter Children. I'm gonna guess he's either a rapper or some music artist, but you know what? If you're gonna take a, a video game music track that people may not know of, you can definitely do worse than uh, this one here, Cherry Blossom Wind Dance. And then the other one that stood out to me on the soundtrack, but deserving of the cutting room floor here, this one here is To Fly Vacantly Like an Eagle. This one is also composed by Osamu Murata, and it gets a little more MIDI-like here. It's a little more simplistic, but it has this good little marching beat, and I kind of like that. You get then the string coming in with like the violin or, whatever, or the viola maybe even, what it's trying to be at least. It's just a nice piece where it's it's got this, you know, we're, we're going to go confront someone sort of energy to it. People in the YouTube comments were even saying like, why do I feel like Rambo? with listening to this, like, oh, okay, that, that's a pull, I suppose. But yeah, this one's another one where, like, I've definitely heard it before. I had forgotten that it was Shenmue, and it's like, oh, yeah, this song, okay. Cutting Room Floor, sure, no context for it being in the game. And maybe that's what I'll never forget about this game, is hearing a lot of these tracks and really appreciating, like, this, this soundtrack's great, but I have zero experience with the game. I wish Joe were here. Sorry I had to turn this into a solo episode this week because it sounds like he's at least experienced Shenmue before. Maybe not positively, but maybe you could give some more context as far as 
the games or the characters. Because I, I, I didn't know who Shenhua was before that. I didn't even know that Shenmu was the tree, okay? So a lot to learn, certainly, when I do research on games that I have not played for this show. But you know what? It feels like I learn a lot and just learn more as a result, of course, with that. And then hopefully that gets passed on to you. And hopefully you've learned some beginner's knowledge about Shenmu and its soundtrack. And that will do it for us this week on Original Sound Chat. You can find me on Twitter at Pete Speakeasy. Joe DeVader, my co-host, will be back next week. You can find him on Twitter at StringPixel. The video version of the show is on the Rhymes with Asia YouTube channel, but it's that MP3 podcast version that you want, and that's hosted by Anonymous Dinosaur at anondino.squarespace.com. That's where Joe's other podcast, Smasterpieces, is hosted. And you can find Smasterpieces and Original Sound Chat wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, even on Spotify. We have a podcast feed of episodes on Spotify, but we also have a video game music playlist. When we've talked about a video game music track on this show and it's on Spotify, it gets added to this massive Original Sound Chat music playlist. What will be added to the playlist Well, you know what? This Shenmue soundtrack is on Spotify. So yes, it's going to get added to that playlist. So many, so many tracks on that big playlist. Listen for hours. And when you're done listening, though, you can find the show on social media at Soundchat OST. Leave some feedback for us. How are we doing with these episodes? Do you like solo episodes? It definitely helps us take a break when we're not feeling well or getting too overwhelmed by work and life, etc. Also, leave some suggestions for us. What games would you like us to cover in the future? We're definitely trying to do more of that in 2022. Next week, Joe will be talking about Keiichi Sugiyama, and I will be talking about Tapi Iwase. Oh, man. Some drama afoot there. To play us out, we like to highlight a fan cover, a fan remix, whether it's on YouTube, OC Remix, wherever. Shenhua stands out as a piece that is really taken to by, you know, YouTube musicians and and things like that. So Schneider Souza on YouTube has what he calls an anime cover of Shenhua, and it features Donut, G-O-T-W, Guitar S-V-D, and Video Games G-E... Oh, it's Video Games Geek with the E's as 3-3. Video Games G-3-3-K. Okay. That's that's just on me. Anyway, they have this cover of Shenhua, and it sounds really nice, so I really enjoyed it. Hopefully you do, too. Thanks so much for listening this week on Original Sound Chat. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>